In October of 2008, on an obscure, anonymous mailing list called the Cypherpunk mailing list, an anonymous participant using the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto announced the publication of a paper and said, I think I have solved a problem in computer science. I have found a way to create a system of electronic cash that is direct between people, peer-to-peer, -peer, as we use the term in computer science. In this system of electronic cash, I have written a white paper, and I have implemented it in software. And on that day, Satoshi Nakamoto published the white paper. You can download it online. Uh, it is available at bitcoin.org. Um, you can do a search for it, the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, or the Bitcoin white paper. And in nine pages, Satoshi Nakamoto described in detail and in ways that predicted many of the things that happened over the next seven years. What Bitcoin was, and what Bitcoin could become, and how it would work. But he didn't stop there, or she didn't stop there, or they didn't stop there. Because we don't know if Satoshi Nakamoto is a man, a woman, or a group of people, or an alien being from the future. Okay, probably not that last one. Satoshi Nakamoto then published software and invited people to participate in running a network. And this gives you the first hint as to how Bitcoin works. Bitcoin is software. Bitcoin is an application, among other things. You download this application, you run it on your computer. You can run it on a laptop, you can run it on a desktop, preferably on a computer that is permanently connected to the internet. It uses quite a bit of RAM and disk space right now, but in those days it was very lightweight. And if you run this program, it reaches out on the internet and it finds other people running this program. You don't know who these people are. It doesn't reach out to specific people. It creates a random mesh network, what we call a peer-to-peer -peer network, where every participant in the system is equal. There is no special computer. They are all just talking to each other. It creates what in network terms we would call a crowd. So, randomly, reaches out and connects to various other computers running the Bitcoin software. And together, they create a network. And that network is used to exchange and propagate transactions. And these transactions are encoded in a digital format. They contain information about the transfer of value and the authorization to transfer value between participants. Nobody controls this network. And this is a critical concept. Nobody controls this network. You can be running one of these computers. You do not control this network. You run one of these applications. It connects to other people. And you run another one of these applications. And it talks Bitcoin to the other computers that are talking Bitcoin. But no one is in control. No one is in charge. Just like when you are running a computer that speaks on the internet and communicates with other computers on the internet, no one is in control. If you interact directly between these systems. That network started on January 3, 2009, and on that day, the world changed. For the first time in the history of money, in the history of trust, in the history of institutions, in the history of humanity, 
a system that is completely independent of authority, is completely independent of institutions, a system that develops trust as the result of collaboration, communication, and computation through cryptography, was born. This system allows people to exchange value, to transmit money. And this money is called Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is the application, it's the software that you run on your computer that communicates with all of the other computers running the Bitcoin software. Bitcoin is the name of the network that runs the Bitcoin network, which is the collection of all of these computers. Some six and a half thousand of them around the world, anywhere there is internet, are the ones we know that advertise their presence, several thousand more that don't, and tens of thousands that simply listen onto this network without actively participating. The Bitcoin network. And all of this is an infrastructure that is used to create and transmit value in the form of transactions expressed in a new currency, the Bitcoin currency. And the Bitcoin currency is unlike any other form of money we have ever seen before. First of all, as a form of money, it does not exist in physical form. It is the culmination of a trajectory we have seen in human history. Over thousands of years, money has become a more abstract form of value. You start with very, very tangible forms of value. Commodities. A goat. A banana. A pineapple. These are very poor forms of money, because you can eat them, and they rot or die, and they can be lost. They are not very good forms of money, because they are the thing of value. We went from that to gold, precious metals, and stamped coins. These are better forms of money, because you cannot eat them. They do not die or rot. They do not represent the value itself. They are not the value. And this is an interesting concept. Money is not the valuable thing itself. Money is the thing you exchange for the valuable thing itself. The reason bananas are not good money is because bananas are the value you are trying to get. Money is the thing you exchange for bananas that has no value in itself. It is simply a symbol, an abstraction. It represents something that can be carried that I can give to someone tomorrow, and they will probably give me bananas. That future promise of value is the essence of money. So the essence of money is the ability to have an abstract token that in itself is immutable, unforgeable, eternal, maintains its value, and represents the exchange of value in the future as a promise. And over time, these things have become less and less physical and more and more abstract.